All right, well, I am excited about today's message. We're going to get right into it. We are in this entire month looking at the faithfulness of God. And, you know, one of the ways we're looking at it, and the reason we're calling this series Days Gone By, is because a lot of times when you're in the middle of something, you're walking through something, and it's all around you, you're in it, it's, it, it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to think that maybe God's not going to show up. It's easy to get down on yourself and believe the lies the enemy wants to put in your mind because you're, you're, you're in the middle of it. You're seeing the facts. You're feeling the facts. And so you're, you, you need to do something that reminds you that God is faithful. And, you know, so many times the best thing that we can do as believers is not to necessarily look around at our, our current circumstance, but to look backwards and to see and remember what God has gotten us through and what God has done for us in the past and to look at the days gone by and remember what he's done. And you know, this is a good, this is a spiritual principle, but it's also, I mean, it's good in the natural uh, as well because it works. And I'm going to share this, this story. This is a personal story uh, of something that's been going on. So I coach my son's uh, soccer teams, Diego and Lucas. Diego, he'll turn 11 in November, uh, which is crazy. It, almost as crazy as that tomorrow uh, my wife and I are celebrating 14 years of marriage because that can't be possible. So it was awesome 14 years ago. Pastor Mike married us, and now he's here on the front row. Look at that, just a full circle of life. Uh, but, you know, so I, I coach him, and he's, he's played his whole life, basically, and as old as he can play, so he's almost 11. And then Lucas, he's playing this year, too, and he's seven. And, and I help coach both of their teams. And uh, a co- I coach the seven-year-old team, Lucas's team, with my best friend, Josh. We, we coach it. And these are six- and seven-year-olds that, that play together. And we, we work together. And when we work together, we keep it pretty good. Because, you know, when you, if you've ever done youth sports, especially at six or seven years old, especially boys, it's like trying to grab water while herding cats at the same time. Like, it's, it's kind of impossible. And they don't really pay attention. But uh, a couple weeks ago, Josh was out of town, and so he wasn't going to be there, so I, I was going to run practice by myself. And I was like, yeah, okay, I, I've got it, no big deal. And so we announced it, we let everyone know, we had a group meet, and I thought, you know, it, it's going to be good, because I'll be here, I'll take care of the kids, but surely, you know, when the parents realize that it's just going to be me and all their kids, someone will stay and kind of help me, you know, keep the kids in check. That did not happen. As soon as, like, I mean, they, they came, they dropped, they left. I don't think some of them even stopped. They just kicked them out of the van while it was rolling and just, like, go to practice, and they left. They were gone. And I was like, okay, 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 cool, cool, cool. And this was only worse because I got these kids, and they're over here in their rough house, and they're wrestling and stuff, like, before practice starts. And over here is a girls' team that's a couple years older, and they're, like, super organized and, like, doing team warm-ups. And not only do they have their two coaches uh, over there, but they even have every parent is there, the entire parent, grandparents are there. There's like 30 adults over there at this team. Dads are there, I guess they took off work. Like, I don't know what's going on. There's so many adults over here and they're organized, it's perfect, and their cones are great. And then I'm over here and we're wrestling in the dirt. We don't have any cones, we got nothing. Like, we look like the bad news bears of soccer. And I'm just like, okay, it's okay, because you know what, it doesn't matter. We're gonna, we're, this is gonna be awesome. So I try to get practice going, and before I can get started, because it's hot, you know, it's hot. They all need to take their shirts off. It could be because the girls are over there, but they just need to take their shirts off. So they're all shirtless. I'm like, that's fine, that's fine, that's great. We're gonna, if that makes you practice well, well, we'll do that. And so I'm like, okay. Well, the first thing, I knew it was gonna be a rough time because I'm like, all right, guys, let's get together, get your soccer balls done. And the first thing they start doing is they start flashing the rim of their underwear to each other. Like, just as like this weird, like, hey, check it out. And then just laugh, and then it was hilarious. And they wouldn't stop. I'm like, okay, stop. No one shows underwear to each other. We're at soccer practice, right? And they just kept like, and they're like, oh, oh, you got me. And I have no clue what they're doing. They're six and seven. They don't know what they're doing, but they just laugh. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. So I'm like here, and I'm trying to like, hey, no. Yeah. And so finally, I mean, they, can't, they won't listen to me. The other thing happened, so I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to make them run a lot. Maybe I can get some of these wiggles out. Let's just let them run. And so I tell them, hey, you're going to just run basically to the back of the auditorium and back. Like, it's not that far. Like, just run there, run back, and then maybe that'll kind of, you know, we'll, we'll jog the system, right? Well, two, two of them made it there and, and back. Two of them got there and decided that was when they were going to die. Like, that was the end for them. Uh, one of them got there and made it three-fourths back, and the reason he made it three-fourths back is because one of the kids, he just made it a quarter of the way there, maybe a little past the front row, and then he decided he can't do anymore, and he just laid down in the dirt. So the other one on the way back, he also decided to lay in the dirt next to him. And I was just like, oh my gosh. They had been running all over. They ran three times the distance when they were playing, trying to see who could get in the ditch first. 
So I'm like, okay, 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 it's okay. It's all right. So now it's time to practice. And I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you guys. Once we get into the soccer, they're going to be ready. Because I'm going to teach them how to be the best soccer players. This is the hope of the United States men's national team. And as long as it's on my watch, we are not going to lose to Trinidad and Tobago. So I have to teach these kids how to grow. And we have to be good. And so they start in line. We get in the line. to They start slapping each other's nipples really hard. Just over and over and over, like just not paying attention. It's like, it's like, ah, you got me. And it's just like painful. And I'm like, okay, no, 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 no. Like, listen, stop slapping each other's nipples. No slapping each other's nipples. Don't show your underwear to each other. Don't slap each other's nipples. Just keep your hands to yourself. Just stop. None of that. You got it? Yeah, okay. So we're back in line. It's the drill. And I've got one of, so five kids are in line. I've got this one kid, and I'm really pouring in all my soccer knowledge. Every bit of technique, because I know it's going to make the difference. I know this is going to be the next messy or something. And so I'm trying to show him this little technique, like, hey, you got to do this. You know, I've got I'm trying to show him. He's not listening at all. He's watching the girls play some game. He's not even, I'm like, no, right here. I need you to look at me. And he's just like, I, I look over. And the boys, the other five boys, have formed a massage train. And they're massaging each other in a massage train. And I'm like, what are you doing? They're like, just a little massage, just a little massage in the line. I'm like, no, no, we don't massage in line. We don't touch each other. We don't massage each other. Not in line. You need to give each other space. Stop slapping each other's nipples. Stop showing your underwear. Like, quit doing this. We're here for soccer. Do you understand? I'm trying to teach you. You don't even know what genius you're wasting. I'm like literally pouring the pearls before swine and you're ruining it. No parents are there. I'm mad at every parent. Girls team super organized over there. And I'm just like, you know what? I can't stand them. I'm just mad. By the end, I literally just threw a soccer ball there. I said, I don't care what you do. Do whatever you want. Just go. You can kick it there. You can score in a go. I don't care. Every parent was late to pick their kids up. Everyone. They showed up. How was practice? I was like, it's great. We massaged each other's backs for a while. Everyone's real loose and ready for the weekend. And you know, I'm like, this is hopeless. This team's hopeless. This is the, this is what, this is just, there's the whole team's a waste. It's just a waste. We should just give up and they should all quit. But you know, a couple days later, I was at Diego's soccer practice. And these kids are, 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 you know, 10, 11 years old. So a couple more years of experience, a couple more years of maturity. And we're out there. And I have a drill. We're doing a drill, and I'm trying to work on some issues. We had some scoring. So I'm, I'm going to teach some finishing. And I start to show some technique. And I start to kind of teach them a little stuff. I'm like, hey, this is how you hit the ball. This is what I want you to drop this shoulder. I want you to open it up and put it. And not only do I realize that they're listening, they actually start asking me some questions. Like, hey, can you show me that again? Can you show me again how you did that? And then they, they started going through practice, and they started to get it. Like, they actually started to do it, and they actually asked some more intelligent questions. And we started doing the drill in a little more complicated manner, and they were understanding it. And then this culminates with the next game, one of the kids actually scored a goal using the exact technique that I taught him. And I felt like the greatest. Because coaches know it's not them, it's all you. Uh, and I saw this, and all of a sudden God reminded me, like, do you remember when Diego was six and seven years old? And all of a sudden I thought back and I was like, oh yeah, oh my gosh. It was worse because we had a kid who would show up to every practice. He never wanted to play soccer. He never wanted to do the drills. He had his own game. It was called Zombies versus Werewolves. And all he would do is he would get out there and from the time it was time to start, he would just close his eyes and walk around like this. Going, Ugh, the entire practice. And he's like, hey man, you want to play? No, I'm just going to play Zombies versus Werewolves. And his parents sat at every practice and were like, doing great, buddy. And he's not doing any of the drills. He's just off playing Zombies versus Were Werewolves. It's rec soccer, so everyone has to play half the game. And he played zombies versus werewolves for half of every single game. Just out there. I put him out there, and he just, uh, eyes closed, no clue. Sometimes he wasn't even on our field. I just let him go, like, because it was like, whatever, man. Just keep playing over there. And I realized that's where we were, but look where we're at now in just a few years. And I get to say, you know what? Lucas's team is not just a complete waste of athletic persons. They can be something. I just have to keep being patient. Why do I know this? Because I can look back and I can remember what God's already brought them through. And I want to look at the Bible at a couple stories because God is about setting up memories, memorials, reminders. He's done it. He's done it forever. 
And there's a story that I think shows such a powerful picture because sometimes we forget. When the kids are in the massage train, you forget. And I want to look at a story, and it's in Joshua, chapter 4. And here's the setup. Joshua is now the leader of the nation of Israel. They have yet to enter the promised land. Moses has died, and he's in charge of Israel. And, you know, they've been wandering around the wilderness for 40 years because Israel just kept complaining, and God finally said, none of you are going to enter into the promised land. And so Joshua was going to lead the Israel, and his first task as the new leader was he needed them to cross the River Jordan. Now, that may not sound like a big deal, but there were no bridges. And this was the rainy season, so the Jordan was very high, and the Jordan flows very fast when it's rainy season. And it's not easy to cross. It's definitely not easy for hundreds of thousands of people, men, women, children, livestock. It's not easy for that to cross. And so he's got to cross the Jordan River. And God says, I want you to do it this way. I want you to get the Ark of the Covenant. I want you to put that out before the people. And when it goes into the water, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a way. And so he obeys. He mobilizes the whole group. It was probably like trying to get a six-year-old to play soccer. But he mobilizes the whole group, and they send the Ark out. And as soon as it gets to the water, it says that the water stopped, that God split the Jordan River, opened it up, and the ark, the people carrying the ark went to the middle of the river, and they stood there, and the Jordan River was stopped. It said it was a wall of water, and it stopped the river, and the entire nation of Israel passed through to the other side while they held this thing there. It was a pretty, it was a long, it was a quad burner. You know, they had to just stand there, but, you know, a lot of people had to walk by. But, but this is where we're at. So Joshua is here, and, and he does something interesting. Uh, I'm going to read this, as, read verse 1, and then we're going to skip to 3 through 7. Uh, in chapter 4, it says, when all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, tell them, take 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan, carry them out, And pile them up at a place where you will camp tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had chosen, one from each tribe of Israel. He told them, go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it out on your shoulder. 12 stones in all. One for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. We will use these stones to build a memorial. Now, just as a side note, that doesn't mean I'm pretty sure there was a pretty good competition that happened here because you had to carry it. And if you get 12 guys and say, hey, we need stones, who can carry the heaviest stones? Someone is going to say, Benjamin, is that all you can carry, bro? Look how big my stone is. That's what you want to be an everlasting memorial to your tribe? <laughs> so small. Some of you don't get it. Neither did the first service. I thought I'd try anyways. This is the part that I want to, I love this. It says, we will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Then you can tell them, they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. And I love this. I love this. He sets up a reminder. He says, I want to remember this day. I want to remember that when we did something, we were faced with something impossible, that God showed up and did something impossible. But, you know, the fact that that Joshua did this is interesting because we have to go backwards sometimes to, to realize why Joshua never even flinched at the thought of crossing the Jordan. He, he never stammered. He never said, oh, I don't know. Can you help? He didn't do any of that. He just said, okay. Because we go back when Moses was in charge and the people of Israel were fleeing the Egyptians, they came up to another body of water, the Red Sea. And they could not cross. And we've heard this story. You know, it's funny. A a lot of times we know this story much better than the one of the crossing of the Jordan. In fact, I was talking with with Vivi before and she actually didn't know the story of the Jordan River crossing. She never heard it. And I was like, I don't know what they taught you at ORU, but you were not in the same classes as me. Uh, Just kidding. I tested out of Old Testament. You know. Uh, (laughs) Nope, I'm not going to go there. Uh, Anywho, so Moses is there. The Egyptians are coming. 
And by the way, the Egyptians are the most powerful nation in the planet at the moment, okay? They're coming. And God tells Moses to go and to hold his rod over there and split the Red Sea. We, we know this one better probably because there was an awesome movie about it. There's been several movies about it, right? Like you get a movie, there's not a movie about crossing the Jordan, not, at least not a good one. Uh, so he opens the, he, he holds out his staff, the, the Red Sea opens, and all of Israel, again, very similar, walks across on dry ground walks across, and then when they're on the other side, they wait until the Egyptians are in the middle of the sea, and he lowers his staff, and they all get drowned, right? And Israel is safe. And they do something. They, they do something as well, but it's different. What happens at the end of this, Moses begins to prophesy and to sing about how good God is, and we're going to remember this day forever. And his sister even starts prophesying and singing songs about how great it is. And all of Israel rejoiced. Three days later, three days, they were low on water. And they were just started grumbling, like, God, you've left us. You've abandoned us. You've brought us out here to die. We will never make it. So God leads them to water. They drink the water. And he's like, God's the best. We love you forever. And then just a few days later, they're like, you left us to starve. We're going to die. He goes and he gives them manna from heaven. And they eat it. And God's the best thing. And you're so good. You're so good. You're so good. And then they're like, I'm so tired of this. I've eaten it every day for like three weeks. I like variety. You know, in Egypt, in Egypt, yeah, we were slaves. Yeah, they killed all of our firstborn kids, and they killed all the males, and yeah, I mean, you know, that was not great, but we had meat. And then God gives them meat, and it's like, but it's the same, I just, I have to, it's just, it's not the same. I mean, I just, it's great. I know it's from heaven and everything, but I don't like it anymore. Kind of just wish we would have stayed. But you know, and Joshua watched this over and over and over, God showing up, people rejoicing, and then forgetting about it. They were, by the way, being, they didn't even need to, they were being led by a pillar of smoke and a pillar of fire. Like you would feel like at one point you'd maybe just look over and be like, oh yeah, I guess God's still in control. There's the pillar of fire. But Joshua watched as they constantly, constantly, constantly forgot. And I realized, I thought, no, that God showed me something, and man, this blessed me so much. I thought, no, at some point, they must have made a memorial. They must have done something to remind themselves, because that's not, that didn't start with Joshua. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they made memorial stones, wells. They did things that were a reminder of God's goodness and God's faithfulness and God's provision. It was a thing. Yet, I started reading, and I started studying, and I realized Moses never set up a reminder. Moses never set up a memorial. Moses never said, this is what we're going to look at when we get to something hard. This is what you're going to tell your children about. He never did it. In fact, the first time that anything, you know, stones were always used as a memorial, as a reminder, as, a, as something. The first time that we actually get the mention of stones, whenever it comes down to, to, to actual rocks in Exodus, is actually after the law has been given and God's telling them how to make an altar. But with the altar, which is, for when you make a mistake, this is how you cover it. This is your reminder that you're going to fall short. The second mention of stones is actually in the giving when they actually write the Ten Commandments on the tablets. The stone that says, this is the law you'll never be able to keep. This is the altar that reminds you that you will constantly fail, and these are the stone tablets that you'll never be able to keep. And the first day that the law was given, 3,000 people died. Their reminder that they had was that they would never live up, that they'd never get there. In fact, they did make a reminder. They, they, they decided that they wanted to remember that their past, their enslavement, the thing that God never wanted for them, they thought was better. That's what they remembered. Not the miracle after miracle after miracle. So Joshua decided to do something different. And it's not the first time he did something different. It's God. (laughs) 
before they crossed the Jordan, Joshua said, we need to have some scouts. Joshua knew about scouting because he was one of the 12 scouts that Moses sent into the promised land. He went and he was one of the two, him and Caleb, who said, we can take the land. But the other 10 said, nope, we can't do it. And that's why Israel never made it. And Joshua was sitting here on the precipice of doing the same thing. And he said, you know what? I'm doing it different. Moses sent 12. I'm only going to send two because there was 10 too many on that trip. If it would have just me and me and Caleb, we would have gone in here a long time ago. Because we knew that God could do it. Because we kept seeing God do it. And we remembered what he did. And so Joshua sent two spies. He said, go to Jericho and scout out the land. They go to Jericho, they scout it out, and they end up in the house of Rahab, the prostitute. And she actually saves their lives. She hides them on the roof and she saves them. And in a discussion with Rahab, and they make this deal like, hey, if you keep us safe, when we come and and attack your city, we will take care of you and your family. They make this deal. But she told them something that I thought was so powerful that I I couldn't believe it when I read it in this concept. In in Joshua chapter 2, she's speaking to the spies. She said, for we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea. Remember, this is before the Jordan. When you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Shion and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. Here's something interesting. The nation of Israel forgot that God got them through the Red Sea. This woman heard about it, and she remembered for 40 years. Sometimes God does something in you, and you may forget, but the people around you remember They remember the stone. that They remember the miracle. They see it. And in this case, she saw it. And she said, I remember. We know that this is your land because of what God's done for you. And we've been waiting here wondering, why have you been walking around for 40 years in the wilderness? When you could have been here. God's doing something. And it's amazing because this is Rahab. And she gets redeemed by the son of the head of Judah. He marries her and redeems her. And then she has a son named Boaz. And then Boaz marries Ruth. And Ruth is the great great grandma of David. And David is the lineage of Jesus. You see, from the very beginning, there's redemption because they remembered what God did. It didn't even happen to her. She saw it and she remembered So the spies came back in verse 24 of chapter 2, and this is their report. The Lord has given us the whole land, they said, for the people in this land are terrified of us. So Joshua was ready, but he did something different. He said, you know what we're going to do? Because God told him, we're going to cross the sea, and I know he's going to do that, but we're going to set ourselves a reminder. We're going to remember this day. We're going to tell our children this day. But not just for this day, because he went ahead and made something up for maybe something that should have happened. Because in in, uh, verse 19, or sorry, verse 23 and 24 of chapter 4, this is what it continues. Joshua says, For the Lord your God dried up the river right before your eyes, and he kept it dry until you were all across, just as he did at the Red Sea when he dried it up until we had all crossed over. You know who we all? It was him and Caleb. They were the only two left. But he remembered. He did this so all nations on earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful and so you might fear the Lord your God forever. You know, God is calling us to remember. To remember what he's done. He's into it. And guess what? For us today, it's something he's still doing. He wants you to have things in your life that you set up as memorials so you can remember the goodness of God. And Jesus gave us a bunch. You know, the first thing he gave us was communion. Because he said, take this bread, this is my body, it's a remembrance of who I am. Do it often and remember it to me. Take this cup and know that your sins were paid for. We have communion and it reminds us and we're taking it next week and we're gonna remember what God's done. We remember what he's doing for us because if we look backwards, we can see all the things that he got us through that we should have never gotten through and we say, what's this today? We're gonna remember. You know what else we have? We have the cross. 
We have the cross to look at and say that my sins were paid for and bought by the blood of Jesus, that his body became the perfect sacrifice so that everything that was unholy in me could be placed on him to be judged so that I could receive all righteousness. I get to look at the cross and I get to remember what he did. But it didn't just stop there because we also have the tomb because it's empty. Because he didn't just die, but he rose again and he's alive today, working on my behalf. And I get to look at that stone that's rolled away and I get to think that God is alive today, living and working in my life. And then we have baptism. Baptism isn't just about getting wet. Baptism's for you to remember that you were crucified with Christ, that you were buried in that grave, but that you're now alive again, a new man, a new woman, free from the sins that are holding you back. And every time you think you can't change, you just get to remember that you were baptized. And that's a remembrance that God said, you've been freed from that. That you've professed your faith in me, so now I've given you a new identity. We're having baptisms the last Sunday of this month. Because someone needs to stand up and say, I want to make a stone remembrance of what God is doing for me. And maybe you've already been baptized. I got baptized at six years old. But when I get to watch people get baptized, I get to remember that I was baptized. I get to remember that God's done something for me. I get to remember the faithfulness of God. I get to remember that there's a good God. And you know what? Israel got faced with the two options. And that's what Joshua is there But under Moses, all they remembered was the fact that they would never live up. That they couldn't even keep the law for one day. And they broke the first rule on the first day. And they would never be able to measure up. But Joshua decided that they were going to set a remembrance of God's faithfulness. That God never leaves you. He never forsake you. He got us through the sea once and he got us through the river again. And you know what? He's going to ask me to do even crazier things because there's a city I need to take down. And he tells me to walk around it seven times. I'm going to do it because I can go out there and I can look at those stones and I can remember what he did. And so if he already did that for me, he's going to finish the work that he began in me. And I'm going to walk around this city and the walls are going to crumble. And I'm going to be in a battle, and he'll literally stop time so that I can finish this battle, and the sun will stay where it is. And we're never going to lose. We're going to continue to take this ground because it's been given to us. And if I ever get nervous, if I ever get weary, if I ever look and say, it doesn't look like it's going to happen, there's too many of them, there's giants in the land, my family's being oppressed, my finances are bad, my relation is bad, I can look back on those pile of stones and I can say, he's already did it once. He's going to do it again. I've got the cross. I've got communion, I've got the grave, I've got, so I've got baptism, and I can see it. I can remind myself. I can stir up my faith and remembrance that he's doing something in me. That he loves me. Some of us need today to set up some stones, to set up a reminder to set up a memorial. Maybe you need to look back because maybe you're in a really bad place right now. Maybe you need to look back and remind yourself of what God's gotten you through. You know, I talked about the fact that I've been married for 14 years, but you know what? The, The person who's standing here today was not the person who stood at that altar 14 years ago. God was faithful. He freed me from all sorts of sins and addictions and wrong beliefs and pride and arrogance and haughtiness. He saved me from it. And I get to look back on that day, which is a memorial of the man who I thought I was and thank God of the man that he's made me today. And so when I fall short today, when I'm not perfect, when I don't be the best man, husband, friend, I get to say, but look where he brought me from. He who started a good work will not... Stop until it's in completion, and God is not a liar. And you know what's the best thing about memorials, just like Rahab? Some people get encouraged by your memorial. Some people get encouraged by your remembrance. Some people get encouraged because they heard your story, because they hear, if he did it for them, then he can do it for me. If he did it for her, he can do it for me. If he did it for that group of people, he can do it for me and my family. What are those stones? Let me tell you about Jesus and what he did. 
And that's why Revelation talks about that we can overcome the enemy and his plans who's already been defeated because of the blood of the lamb and the power of their testimony. Because their testimony is what shares what Jesus has done, what the blood of the lamb has bought. And we get to celebrate people's stories. The enemy wants you to believe that your history and your story and that even just because God was faithful, the fact that he had to rescue you, you should be embarrassed about it and you shouldn't share that story. But your testimony, your story is a living memorial that encourages the brothers and sisters in faith around you and reminds you that God's doing something. Your story gets to be a stone that reminds us of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And so for the rest of this month, every Sunday, we're gonna have someone share their testimony. We're gonna have someone share their story of how God did something and they made a memorial out of it. And when times are hard today, they get to look back and think that, and you know what? You're gonna be blessed by it. You're gonna be encouraged by it. You're gonna see the goodness of God. Because we're a church that's about building stones to remember how good God is. And it's going to be awesome. And you guys are going to be encouraged. So we're going to sing, and then we're going to hear a powerful testimony from a young lady named Olivia, who's on staff here. She's awesome. And she's going to share a story about when she set down a stone in her life. Come on, let's go ahead and stand up and we're going to sing a little bit. Just remember all that he is to us, his faithfulness this morning. God's faithfulness goes back to March 31st, 2012, when I was 14 years old. I left the day before to go to a sleepover, and before leaving, I said goodbye to my mom, who had been battling cancer and was now in hospice, with her hospital bed set up in our living room. I remember I kissed her, and I said goodbye, I love you. That night, around 3.30, my dad texted me. All it said was, hey, and I didn't answer. I was 14, so I was tired and confused as to why he was texting me so early. And when I woke up, my friend's mom took us to church for a serve day uh, to volunteer. I had called my dad to ask him to bring my, my allergy medicine. He picked me up, and as I got in the car, he said, we're going home to get your allergy medicine, and we need to talk. Last night, your mother stopped breathing. I responded, oh, so she's back in the hospital. He said, no, she, she, passed, she passed away. My mother's two-year fight against cancer was over. And while she was finally healed and whole, losing her was the most difficult event of my life. However, it was also the beginning of God showing himself to me. You see, I see him every time I think about her. Every time I think it would be better if she was here, he comforts me. Every milestone I've hit, driving, turning 18, graduating high school, starting college, getting my first job, and even working here. I felt her loss. But even more overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly still, I feel God's love for me. His comfort and faithfulness show me that I belong to him and that he is with me while she is waiting for me in heaven. 
God has been faithful at every point in my life so far, and when I think about the future, I know I can trust him to be faithful still. Someday, when I search for a wedding dress without her by my side, or when I have a child and I tell them about their grandma, at every milestone that's ahead, I have no reason to believe that God won't be with me, for I know him as my faithful father who has been and always will be everything to me. There'll be a season for joy and weeping in everything our God is faithful. His arms are open and I will come running now and always our God is faithful. Come on church. faithful and we get to be a church that's about celebrating the faithfulness of God and setting up these stones to remind ourselves that God's doing something he's doing insi something inside of us he's doing something inside of you he's building something and you're part of it your story is part of it you know, even after first service, I had people coming to me saying, I've had stories that I've wanted to tell, and I've been afraid to share them because I thought people would think I was crazy, or I thought people thought think that I was too much, or I had people think that my story isn't good enough or it would disqualify me, or they would look down on me because of the situation I had gotten myself into that God had to rescue me. And guess what? Those are all lies. You're forgiven. Your past is forgiven. You have good standing with God. And he longs for your story to change people's life because your story is the story of God's faithfulness in your life. And it reminds people that there's hope when they're struggling. It reminds people that there's something better than their, what they're walking through. And the thing that the enemy meant to hurt you, God uses for your good and works it out on your behalf so that you prosper from it. Because that's the God we serve, the faithful God who continues to get you across the river when you can't make it on your own. And, and today, maybe you're here and you've never accepted Jesus. That's the greatest stone that you can set out. That's the greatest line in the sand. That's the greatest remembrance is when you accept Jesus. And we're going to say a prayer real quick, all together. And in fact, you can just repeat after me and say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me so that I could be forgiven and so I could be reminded of my standing with God. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen.